Hi, this is the recording to accompany the slides on the lecture on nervous signaling. My name is Dr. Alita Partsasadarso, and I'll be walking you through the slides. So this is an overview of what I'm going to cover in this lecture. So we're going to start with a short description on the physiology or function of neurons, followed by a discussion on the membrane potential in terms of um, its relationship with to electrical activity, as well as the ion channels and their gates that actually help to uh, form the membrane potential. We're going to then follow up by talking about a couple of important um, channels that are found along the uh, neurons and then talking about the action potential in terms of the process, the presence of a refractor, refractory period, and how the action potential moves or is propagated down the axon. And then we're going to finish off by talking about graded potentials, which are small potential, small changes in membrane potentials um, in terms of the two different types of uh, graded potential and the two different ways that these graded potentials can be um, added together or summated in order to determine whether or not an action potential is formed um, in the subsequent neuron. So let's begin. So in terms of the physiology of neurons, you know that the function of the neurons is to regulate and integrate body activities in a very, very rapid fashion. Um, in terms of characteristics, neurons have two main characteristics, the first one being excitability, which is the ability to initiate or start um, electrical signals. And the second one is conductivity, which is the ability to transmit those electrical signals. In terms of uh, the electrical signals, when it goes down the uh, neuron, it's called a nerve impulse or an action potential and I'll be using those two terms interchangeably. And what happens is that these action potentials are received by the dendrites, collected at the axon hillock, which I'm going to indicate by the letter number two, and then at the axon hillock, um, all the uh, um, graded potentials will be um, looked at and determine whether or not an action potential can be generated. Once it's generated, it is transmitted down the axon to the axon terminal where um, neurotransmitters will be released into the synapse to bind with its specific receptors on the membrane of the effector cells. So the effector cell, the cell at, that receives the input is called the postsynaptic neuron because it's after the synapse, whereas the cell, uh, the neuron that actually starts the action potential, it's called the presynaptic neuron. So in talking about membrane potential, what you should know is that the membrane potential is a difference in charge or electrical activity inside the cell compared to the charge outside the cell, right? Um, if you look at the diagram on the right, the bar graph on the right, you can see that the concentration of ions inside the cell, intracellular fluid, is um, approximately the same as the um, concentration of ions outside, but it's just the difference in uh, ionic composition inside and outside the, the, the cell that generates this membrane potential. So at rest, the membrane potential is um, called the resting membrane potential, and it's generally minus 70 millivolts across the membrane. And this is maintained by keeping uh, most of the body's sodium 
outside the cell in either the interstitial fluid or the plasma and keeping most of the body potassium inside the cell in the intracellular fluid. What happens in terms of maintaining that electrically active, active cell membranes um, is keeping the um, a difference in, in potential and a difference in membrane co concentrations outside compared to inside the cell. So um, the transports of substances uh, depends on the properties of the substance. So when you have small uncharged lipophilic or hydrophobic substances, it can diffuse down the concentration gradient without any help. So it can just go through the uh, lipid bilayer. But if you have small charged hydrophilic particles, for example, ions, it requires a transmembrane or integral membrane protein to actually cross the cell membrane. So what happens is when these ions, these charged hydrophilic particles, uh, move down the concentration gradients, they require ion channels to actually move across the lipid uh, bilayer where when it goes against the concentration gradient, it requires an active uh, transport um, membrane. So um, the most common active transport um, mem uh, proteins that trans transport ions against their concentration gradients are called active transport pumps. And in this one, this is an example of an active transport pump which uses ATP as its energy source to actually um, return sodium um, to its extracellular space. And you can see in the extracellular space, there's more sodium ions than they are inside the cell. And it also returns potassium against its concentration gradient. You can see there's more potassium inside the cell then outside, it returns potassium to the inside of the cell um, with the help of the active transport pump. When we look at these ion channels, um, what we see is that these ion channels are made from integral membrane protein or transmembrane protein. So again, those two terms are used in interchangeably. These ion channels only allow passive transport, so it requires no energy and it um, allows ions to move down its concentration gradient. So if you look at the right-hand um, diagram, you can see that there's more of this hexagonal ions outside the cell compared to inside the cell. And when the, the um, ion channels are open, it diffuses the ion into the cell. These ion channels are charge specific, so we call that uh, electrochemical exclusion. They also are um, exclude certain ions dependent on size. So ion channels for smaller ions will have smaller openings and those for larger ions will have larger openings. There are two main types of ion channels. One is non-specific, the other one is specific. So the non-specific ion channels, even though it's non-specific, is not completely non-specific. So we have cat ion channels, which allow positively charged ions to cross the membrane. And we've got anion channels, which allow negatively charged ions, any negatively charged ions to cross the membrane. We also have specific ion channels, such as the uh, sodium ion channel, um, which only allows sodium to diffuse across the membrane. And we've got specific potassium ion channels that only allow potassium and not sodium to diffuse across the membrane. The last property of ion channels is that some of them are gated. So gated means that they have a gate which open and close. And when the gates are open, it allows diffusion of the ion. When they are closed, it inhibits, it stops the ion from diffusing. 
So um, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and talk about just the different types of gates that are found on various ion channels. So you can see over here that there's four different types of gates that are associated with ion channels. And again, when it's open, then the ions can diffuse across the membrane. When the gates are closed, the ions cannot diffuse across the membrane. So the first type of gated ion channels are the leakage channels. And so the leakage channels, as the name suggests, basically leaks ions. So they're randomly gated, that it opens and closes at random, seemingly random times, but that the, the random opening and closing of these leakage channels are intrinsically controlled. So the leakage channels contributes to maintaining the resting membrane potential. And uh, again, like all ion channels, it allows diffusion of ions across the membrane. So if you look at the diagram at the top, this is a, a leakage um, ion channel. So when it's closed, these ions cannot diffuse across the ion channel. When it's open, it, it, it allows the uh, uh, ions to move from a region of high concentration to a region of lower concentration. The second type of ion channel, gated ion channel, is called the voltage gated ion channel. So depending on the membrane potential or the voltage across the membrane, it opens and closes. And different types of membrane uh, voltage gated uh, ion channels open and close in response to different membrane potentials. So with this one, you can see that when the membrane potential is minus 70, the voltage, this particular voltage gated channel is closed. So when it's closed, it stops the ions from diffusing in it, across it. And when the voltage changes, becomes depolarized to minus 50, so it becomes more positive or less negative, then the voltage gated ion channel opens and then the ions can actually diffuse across the membrane. The third type of gated ion channel is the mechanical or stimulus gated channel. So what happens is in the absence of a stimulus, um, the ion, the mechanically gated ion channel is closed, so no ions can go through. And once it's activated by the stimulus, and the stimulus can be either touch, pressure, temperature, or pain, or something else, once it's activated by a specific stimulus, then it opens. So you can see here that this is a non-specific ion channel because once this mechanically gated channel opens, it allows uh, sodium to diffuse into the cell and it allows potassium to diffuse out of the cell all through the same ion channel. And then the fourth type of uh, gated ion channel is called the ligand gated ion channel. So the ligand is a substance that can bind to a specific receptor. So the substance can be either a neurotransmitter that's produced by the body or a drug that is um, internalized from outside. And so what happens is that the substance or ligand binds to a receptor. And you can see here in number four over here in the first um, uh, frame, the, um, the ligand here is acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. And if acetylcholine does not bind to its receptor, then the ion channel is closed. Once acetylcholine binds to a receptor, the, um, the ion channel opens and with um, acetylcholine, what happens is that it allows um, sodium and um, calcium, in this case, to actually go through, right? Um, some um, voltage gated, uh, some ligand gated uh, ion channels also allow um, other ions like potassium to actually diffuse out of the cell. Again, depending on the cell, the location of the cell in the body and the neurotransmitter involved.
So you've got these four different gated ion channels. And these are very, these gates are very important because then it, it stops um, ions from diffusing across the membrane at all times. It controls the flow of ions across the membrane. We're going to continue on um, talking about voltage gated ion channels. And these are um, three important voltage gated ion channels that are important in the um, function of the nerve, right? So the first one is the voltage gated ion channels that are involved in generating and transmitting or propagating action potentials. So the two that are important in generating and propagating action potentials are sodium, uh, voltage gated sodium channels and voltage gated potassium channels. When voltage gated sodium channels open, um, sodium diffuses into the cell right? Because remember, sodium is found mostly out of the cell and the me membrane potential because sodium enters into the cell becomes less negative or more positive. And the term for this is that the membrane potential depolarizes. The second type of voltage gated ion channel that's involved in generating and propagating action potentials is the voltage gated potassium channels. And if you look over here, most potassium in the body is found inside the cell. So when they open, potassium diffuses out of the cell and the membrane potential, because there's a positively charged ion that leaves the cell, the membrane potential becomes more negative. Right? And because you've got positively charged potassium leaving the cell, it becomes less positive. And the term for this is that the membrane potential becomes more negative, so it hyperpolarizes or undergoes hyperpolarization. So potassium and volt uh, and sodium. Um, voltage gated channels are involved in generating and propagating action potential. And then the second type of voltage gated um, ion channel is involved in signal transduction. So the creation of a signal, um, and these are voltage gated calcium channels, right? So what happens is these voltage gated calcium channels over here are open when an action potential travels down the axon, axon and reaches the axon terminal. And when it does, it changes the voltage of the axon terminal and opens up the calcium ion channels. And when calcium ion channels open, calcium diffuses into the axon terminal. And when calcium enters into the axon terminal, then the vesicles that contain the neurotransmitters fuse with the plasma membrane and releases the neurotransmitter. So again, I'm going to talk about that in more detail as we continue on. So let's move on and talk about the role of voltage-gated sodium um, ion channels in the initiation and prop propagation of ion channels. As I said, most of the um, sodium um, ion channels in the body, uh, most of the sodium in the body is located in the extracellular flu fluid outside the cell in either interstitial fluid or in plasma. Voltage gated ion channels contains two gates. The two gates are called the activation gate and the inactivation gate. And both of those gates need to be open in order for sodium to diffuse into the cell. So if the activation gate is open and the inactivation gate is closed, sodium cannot diffuse across the membrane. If the activation gate is closed, and the inactivation gate is open, sodium also cannot diffuse across the, the channel. 
if both activation gate and inactivation gates are closed, sodium also cannot diffuse across the membrane. And if both activation gate and inactivation gate are open, sodium can diffuse across the, the membrane. Again, this um, slide is just to highlight that both of those um, gates need to be open for sodium to diffuse across the channel. So when we look at the opening and closing of these two gates um, in the process of the generation of the action potential, um, we've got this. So at rest, when nothing's happening, membrane potential sits at around minus 70. And what happens at rest is um, that the, um, the inactivation gate is open. You can see over here, but the activation gate is closed. So when that happens, sodium cannot diffuse into the cell. When the membrane, so this is what happens at resting over here. When um, the membrane depolarizes or becomes more positive over here. And when it reaches minus, 40, uh, minus 55 millivolts, then what happens is that the activation gate opens, right? And we see from the previous slide that the inactivation gate is already open. So in this, in this scenario, both gates are open and so sodium can enter into the cell. And so when sodium enters into the cell, the positively charged ion increases the membrane potential in a process called depolarization. So the membrane potential becomes less negative, so it moves towards zero and overshoots zero to become positive. And when it reaches about positive 30 millivolts, what happens is then, then that's a signal for the inactivation gate to close, right? While, while um, the activation gate stays open. And because one of the two gates is closed, then sodium stops diffusing across, right? So this is when sodium, sodium stops diffusing across. And because there's something else going on with another ion channel that we'll look at in the next slide, what happens is that the membrane potential goes back down, becomes repolarized, moves away from zero. And um, once it uh, reaches minus 55 again, what happens is that the activation gate closes and the inactivation gate opens. And again, for totally different reasons, sodium no, also still cannot diffuse across the membrane. And then it stays that way. So no sodium moves um, until another action potential comes along. So when you look at this and you compare this um, sequence over here together with the diagrams over here, together with the action potential, what you can see is that in terms of the voltage gated sodium um, channels, it's only open when the, uh, ac uh, when the membrane potential hits minus 55 to when it gets to positive 30. And this is when sodium enters into the cell. And the reason why sodium can enter into the cell is that both the activation and the inactivation gate are open um, and all other parts, you either have one or the other or both gates closed. And if one or the other or both gates are closed, then no sodium can diffuse across the cell. I hope that makes sense. Second important voltage gated ion channel in terms of Propa uh, initiating and propagating action potentials is the voltage-gated potassium channel. And thankfully, the voltage-gated potassium channel only has one gate. So when it's open, potassium can diffuse out of the, of the cell. When it's closed, potassium cannot diffuse out of the cell. So um, at rest, what happens is at minus 70, potassium channel gate is closed. So it's closed right over here until 
the membrane potential um, depolarizes to about minus 50 millivolts. And at minus 50, what happens is the gate opens very, very slowly. So you can see here at minus 50, it's open. And when it's open, potassium leaves the cell. But because um, at this stage, potassium is leaving the cell at the same time as sodium entering the cell, um, there's more sodium entering into the cell. So with more sodium entering into the cell, the membrane potential continues to be depolarized until it reaches minus 30, where sodium, um, where the sodium gated uh, ion channel um, closes and sodium stops um, diffusing um, into the cell. And so at this point, from when it reaches the height of the action potential to when it reaches the bottom, it's only potassium leaving the cell, right? So when potassium leaves the cell, it becomes um, um, more uh, negative. So the membrane potential drops. And it um, at some point when it reaches minus 50, then what happens is the potassium gate closes slowly. So because it closes slowly, again, potassium um, is still leaving the cell until it reaches um, a hyperpolarized state, and, and in which case the, the potassium gate is completely closed. And so at this stage, then potassium stops leaving the cell, stops diffusing out of the cell. And from its depth as um, when it's hyperpolarized to when it goes back to resting membrane potential, you've got the... Um, sodium potassium ATPase pump in play, as well as non-gated ion channels actually returning the hyperpolarized membrane potential back to its resting membrane potential. So again, let's put this all together, right? Let's put what happens with potassium and sodium gated channels together. So what we have here is that you have a stimulus opening a stimulus gated, oh, sorry. So let's start off with resting membrane potential. So resting membrane potential, nothing happens. And then at some point, there's a stimulus that opens the stimulus gated sodium channels. And when that opens, sodium diffuses into the cell. It makes the po membrane potential more positive or less negative until it reaches threshold. Once threshold is reached, then the voltage gated sodium channels open, right? And the action potential starts. If threshold is not reached, then the voltage gated sodium channels re remain closed and no action potential start. So this threshold is a very, very important um, piece in the generation of the action potential because it needs to be reached in order for an action potential to, to occur. And this concept of threshold needing to be reached um, is, um, if not an action potential doesn't happen, is called the all or nothing principle. So once an action, uh, once threshold is reached, it generates an action potential, that's all. And if threshold is not reached, no action potential is generated. So that's nothing. So it's called an all or nothing um, principle. When we look at what happens within the context of an action potential and the gated ion channels, what we see is this. At resting membrane potential in the dark blue, what happens is you have the leakage ion channels opening and closing at random uh, times, allowing sodium and potassium to go across its um, across the membrane. And the sodium potassium ATPase uh, pump is also active to maintain that um, to maintain sodium outside the cell and to keep potassium inside the cell. Um, when there is a stimulus, it opens the stimulus gated, or if there's a, a neurotransmitter which binds to the ligand gated sodium channels, um, what happens is then sodium diffuses in. 
the membrane potential becomes less negative or more positive, so it undergoes depolarization until threshold is reached. So threshold is around minus uh, 55. Um, so the membrane potential then, um, when it reaches minus 55, it opens up voltage-gated sodium channels, allows more sodium to rush in, and then um, as it goes up and becomes depolarized, you have the voltage-gated potassium channels opening slowly at minus 50 to allow potassium to diffuse out. And once potassium diffuses out and the sodium-gated ion channels are closed, then the membrane potential becomes more negative, repolarizes, and then when it reaches this hyperpolarization stage, then um, with the help of leakage ion channels and the sodium potas potassium ATPase pump, it goes back to resting membrane potential. So there are a lot of moving pieces in this. Um, but this allows our nervous system to actually stay healthy. And as I said before, the nervous system helps to coordinate and integrate bodily activities very, very quickly. So I've mentioned the sodium potassium ATPase uh, pump, and this kicks in after an action potential ends. So again, because it's a pump, it requires energy, and the energy is ATP together with the enzyme to break down ATP into adenosine diphosphate. Um, and it moves particles against their concentration gradient. So what you can see here is the sodium at, um, poten potassium ATPase pump moves sodium against its concentration gradient. So you can see here that sodium is found more in the extracellular space compared to the intracellular space. So it moves sodium against its concentration gradient while at the same time moving potassium against its concentration gradient back into the cell. So you can see here potassium is found more inside the cell compared to out of the cell, where sodium is found more outside the cell compared to inside the cell. So the sodium potassium um, pump basically returns sodium and potassium back to its, its, uh, its um, uh, fluid compartment. So this is how it works. So in step one, you've got three sodium ions uh, inside the cell bumping, sorry, um, binding to the pump on the intracellular side of the membrane. And then what happens is ATP binds to the pump on the intracellular side. ATP is hydrolyzed or broken down by ATPase into ADP and a phosphate group. And um, that hydrolyzation of ATP um, forces the pump to undergo a change a conformational change, so a change in its structure, and that change in the structure allows it to push sodium out into the extracellular space, bind to two potassium ions from the extracellular space, and push it into the intracellular space. And once that happens, once three sodium ions leaves and two potassium ions return, then what happens is the pump is then ready to start another cycle and begin all over again. And so in this way, it keeps most of the body sodium out of the cell and keeps most of the body's potassium into, in, inside the cell. So I've talked about how action potentials are generated in N. And in this slide, what I'm going to talk about is the refractory period. So you can see here the refractory period starts when the membrane potential reaches threshold to when it returns to resting membrane potential. And in this period, um, an action potential cannot occur, e a second, sorry, action potential cannot occur easily. And so what happens is the refractory period stops action potential from um, developing right on top of each other. Now, within the refractory uh, period, there are two sub 
categories. The first one is an absolute refractory period, which is highlighted in the green over here. And this is when a second action potential cannot occur, regardless of how strong an additional stimulus is. And this is because the depolarization uh, of the membrane potential closes the inactivation gates of the voltage-gated sodium um, ion channels. So it means that no sodium can diffuse into the cell. The second uh, period, refractory period, is called the relative refractory period, highlighted here in the pink. And in this period over here, a second action potential can occur. if the stimulus is strong enough. And with this one, what happens is the inactivation gate can open, and when that opens, sodium can actually enter into the cell. And so you can have a second um, action potential starting very quickly um, if it occurs, if the stimulus occurs during the re relative refractory period. Um, I've talked about depolarization and talked about direction of um, transmission of the action potential, and I've talked about how it can only be it can only move away from the cell membrane down the axon towards the axon terminal. So this slide actually explains why. So if we have depolarization occur, what happens is that de the depolarization um, will start at the proximal end of the axon, but you can see here is that the direction of spread only occurs distally towards the axon terminal. And the reason is that um, when it actually moves down the uh, axon towards the axon terminal, the part proximal to that is undergoing repolarization. So again, it's undergoing a refractory period, so you cannot actually generate an action potential distal, uh, sorry, proximal to the depolarized um, spot. And so what happens is depolarization then occurs in the next segment, but because the, the segment proximal to the depolarized segment is undergoing repolarization, it can't return back towards the cell body. It can only move or be propagated towards the axon terminal. And so what you can see here is the depolarization moves down the axon towards the axon terminal. The next thing I'm going to talk about is how quickly it propagates or spreads down the axon. And the speed that it propagates down the axon depends on the amount of myelination covering the axon terminal as well as the diameter or um, width of the axon itself. So um, the larger the axon diameter, the faster it spreads, the more it's myelinated, the faster it goes down. So if an axon contains myelin, you have what's called a myelinated axon. So you've got these um, rolls of myelin over here, and then you've got the spaces in between without myelin called the node of Ranvier. And um, action, uh, action potentials undergo what's called saltatory conduction down the myelinated um, axon at very, very quick speeds. And what happens is that in this example with a myelinated axon, uh, voltage-gated ion channels are only present at these nodes. And so what happens is that these voltage-gated ion channels um, open and the action potential basically skips from one node to the next, to the next, to the next. And that skipping basically allows very, very fast transmission. If 
and axon has little or no myelin, it undergoes what's called continuous conduction. So in continuous conduction in an unmyelinated um, axon, what happens is you've got voltage gated sodium channels all the way down the axon. And so it basically strolls down the axon through the process that I talked about before very um, slowly. It's just a leisurely st st stroll down the axon until it reaches the axon terminal. Next two things I'm going to talk about is graded potentials or generated potentials. And so what happens is you've got this neuron one and neuron two over here. And you can see, um, you know now that the uh, action potential gets transmitted away from the cell body towards the action, the axon terminal where you um, have the release of neurotransmitters binding to receptors on the dendrites of um, neuron two. Um, and depending on the amount of neurotransmitter release, depending on um, how many ion channels and what type of ion channels are, are open on neuron two, that would either lead to um, a less negative um, membrane potential in neuron two or a more negative membrane potential in neuron two. If the, um, if the ion channels in neuron two that are open um, allows, um, say, sodium or calcium to diffuse into the cell, then what happens is you have a little bump, positive bump over here. And you can see these little positive bumps over here don't actually generate action potentials until it reaches this magic threshold um, level. And so these little bumps of depolarization are called excitatory postsynaptic potential. So it, it's excitatory because it makes the membrane potential less, less negative. It's postsynaptic because it occurs in the neuron that's after the synapse, and it's potential because it changes the membrane potential, right? So the excitatory um, postsynaptic uh, potential basically depolarizes the membrane, right? If it reaches threshold, then an action potential is generated. If there are different types of ion channels open, for example, if there are chloride ion channels open or potassium ion channels, what happens is chloride, chloride will diffuse into the cell to make it more negative, right? Or potassium will diffuse out of the cell to make it more negative, in which case, the, the potential will become more negative or hyperpolarized. And this uh, signal is called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Inhibitory because it makes the membrane potential less, less negative. Inhibitory also because it makes it so much harder for the membrane potential to reach threshold. Right, so some um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs um, work by allowing chloride ion channels to actually open and allowing chloride to diffuse into the cell. So that makes it less likely for anxiety to actually um, be uh, be present. Right, it, it 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 inhibits the likelihood of threshold being reached. It inhibits the likelihood of an action potential uh, being uh, generated, and therefore it calms the mind down if it's in the central nervous system. And then what happens is that um, you can see that um, the nerve is uh, very, the neuron is very complex, and it can have a series of um, IPSP and EPSP. Right? It has a series of inhibitory postsynaptic potential as well as excitatory postsynaptic potential. So if you have a combination of both excitatory and inhibitory, what will actually trigger action potential? And the trigger for an action potential to be generated is when it reaches 
threshold. And so what happens is the combination or the addition of inhibitory and excitatory postsynaptic potential actually is added up in the axon hillock, right? And if threshold is reached, action potential occurs, threshold not reached, action potential does not occur. And the summation can occur either spatially or temporally. So in spatial summ summation, what happens is you've got Few a few different um, neurons, presynaptic neurons, actually sending action potentials um, at the same time towards a postsynaptic um, neuron. And what happens is when these um, postsynaptic potentials from these different um, presynaptic neurons reach threshold then what happens is action potential is generated in the postsynaptic neuron, right? So spatial summation is you have several um, presynaptic neuron stimulating a postsynaptic neuron simultaneously. Temporal summation is when you have one presynaptic neuron. See, this is the only presynaptic neuron that's firing and it fires multiple times very, very quickly. So you can see here, each of these spikes is an action potential, and you can see the action potentials are fired very, very quickly in very quick su succession. And the combination of um, the EPSBs reach threshold, and once they reach threshold, then the postsynaptic neuron fires. I know that this is a um, difficult and convoluted um, lecture, so I hope you have the time to actually listen to it a few times. Um, you can YouTube or go through um, some of the um, suggested um, videos or animation on Canvas just to see, um, just to learn a little bit more about this. Thank you.